The most common historical fallacy is assuming the past was like the society we have now, but with inferior technology and lower living standards. I'm calling it the Flintstone fallacy, because it'd be like imagining if the Stone Age had traffic wardens patrolling the parking lots filled with wheels and wooden clubs. It can be hard to understand that for most of human history, civilization survived without what we have today, like a police force, show business, and even advertising. Noam Chomsky talks about how the baseball games he attended as a youth in the 30s and 40s America were barren of any sponsored publicity. Compare that to any major sporting event now, and you can't help but notice advertising taking up every inch of every sport shirt, stadium banner, and jumbotron. Unless you don't notice. Advertising is so commonplace now that you might no longer see it. You might even think it's not having an effect on you. So how did we get here? How did advertising start? How has it shaped society? And how many adverts will appear during this video? Well, it's time to learn how history works as we explore how advertising infected everything. We now turn your attention away from our scheduled programming to bring you a message from our sponsor, Skillshare. Say folks, ever fancied broadening your noggin? Well, I got news for you. Skillshare, the bee's knees of online learning is here. Dive into a world of pizzazz and creativity or get the lowdown on the latest in modern day advertising like marketing and social media. In this hustle and bustle life, not every Joe's path is cut from the same cloth. But don't you fret, Skillshare's got your back, tailoring lessons to fit you just right and paving the way for opportunities you'd never dreamt of. Just the other day, I wrapped up a swell class titled Empower Your Brand, crafting a powerful narrative to redefine your business. As I roll up my sleeves to jazz up my brands in this modern age, Skillshare's been my right-hand man, dishing out the know-how every step of the way. And believe me, that's just a taste. With Skillshare, there's a whole shebang of knowledge waiting for you, all set to help you shoot for the moon in your professional endeavors. Start your learning journey today with Skillshare. The first 500 people to use my link will get access to one of Skillshare's best offers. Chapter 1. Origins It's said that marketing is as easy as picking an object to market and picking a group to market too. You use the idiosyncrasies of that group to tailor your persuasive rhetoric and voila, advertising. You could say that this means advertising is as old as the human condition, because it is born out of psychology. But in the modern day, we recognize it as being tied with a capitalistic market. The first advertisement in America appeared in a 1704 edition of the Bolton Newsletter. It wasn't as flashy as print ads nowadays, but it was the first time a company paid for space in a printed publication. But you could trace the origins of marketing all the way back to the ancient civilizations of Egypt and Rome, where papyrus was used to make sales messages and wall posters. These precursors to billboards use fabricated reeds from the River Nile, with the first ever written ad being created around 3000 BC. It promoted a weaving shop, but also doubled as a missing poster for a slave. Even back then, people were sticking up flyers in the neighborhood when they lost property. Speaking of which, lost and found posters have also been discovered in the ruins of Pompeii in Arabia, and markings on cave walls around Asia and Africa have been dated as far back as 4000 BC. These might not have been the buy one get one free campaigns we see now, but it does prove how humans were experimenting with attracting attention at the start of civilization. It seems that every time a new medium of communication is discovered, humans quickly employed it to promote ideas, including services. In fact, some of the advertising was oral. Take the classic of poetry, the oldest existing collection of Chinese poetry. It records 350 works of lyrical prose from between the 11th to 7th centuries BCE, and yet it contains mention of candy sellers attracting clients by playing on bamboo flutes. So whereas the western civilizations hit the ground running with slogans, the eastern societies got the head start on jingles. Chapter 2. Mind Games The next natural evolution was things that you've likely seen in fantasy video games or old comic books. Store signs. No doubt, the ancient Egyptians' hieroglyphics laid the groundwork for visual design, but it would take centuries for logos to emerge. In the interim, the village blacksmith or town butcher signaled their crafts with simple, recognizable images. Literacy was not widespread, and art even less known, but over time, society got to the stage where people knew what a picture of an axe meant even if they couldn't spell it. In fact, the allocation of families to trades and communities was how surnames emerged. Smith is one of the most common surnames in the world, and means at one point the family lineage revolved around a smithing forge. As for Thatcher? That's someone who thatches straw roofs. So in some ways, you could say the emergence of surnames was itself a form of advertising. And let's not forget the town crier. 
Before radio, the only way businesses could promote themselves on the airwaves was through the lungs of the loudest guy around. Let's not forget that the most successful form of advertising has always been word of mouth, but there were also trademarks. The earliest examples can be traced to India in 1300 BCE. The practice had craftsmen imprint images, usually ones associated with the work or themselves, into clay. In turn, the seals of approval would harden. By the medieval period, hallmarks emerged which were pretty much just trademarkers but for fancier objects like noble metals. And this is how things went for centuries, until the 15th century when the printing press was established. Though it did stay in the hands of the elites, it did change the direction of history. Now, books and pamphlets could be mass-produced and transported across borders to reach new audiences, and soon newspapers and magazines would emerge which increased the frequency of publication. With one invention, the rate and scale of communication had multiplied. Weekly gazettes and trading cards, no, not the Pokemon kind, were commonplace. Take a Londoner haberdasher from the 1670s named Jonathan Holder. Every customer that came through his door got a printed list of stocks plus their pricing. Whether Holder was the inventor or trendsetter remains disputed, but what is agreed is this introduced psychology into pricing. Before, any price was privy to the merchant. It was up to them and the client if they wanted to negotiate or barter. But by putting prices out there, customers could be persuaded, or discouraged, from doing business with someone before ever visiting their shop. Nowadays, there's an entire wing of advertising that focuses on the psychology of pricing. Take for example the common practice of selling something for $9.99 rather than a solid $10. This one cent decrease makes it feel like we're getting a bigger bargain than we're actually getting. Another tactic is used by entrepreneurs, those self-help get-rich-quick guys whose programs and books tend to be priced with a 7 at the end. Some studies say this is because the number 7 is seen as lucky in the West whereas others say it feels like a bigger saving than 99 cents. One thing is for certain, it works. These tactics got their grounding in 1776. 70 years earlier, the Bolton newsletter printed the first paper ad, but it was the American Army's first recruitment poster for the War of Independence that proved advertising could have an effect on hearts and minds outside of commerce. It took a couple of millennia, but now advertising wasn't just some way to let people know you sold meat. Now it was a way to change history. Chapter 3. Supply and Demand The industrial age skyrocketed the spread of advertising like never before. There simply wasn't a viable business alive that didn't need some sort of promotional material, be it a storefront banner or magazine article. In the 1830s, the first billboards were erected. They were created by Jared Bell to promote circus acts like Barnum & Bailey. This made it the first time advertising could exist in the real world as its own thing, and not part of something else, like a page in a newspaper. The summer after that, a Parisian newspaper called La Presse abandoned its subscriber model to become the world's first paper to rely on paid advertising. Selling page space helped lower its price, which in turn extended readership and thus raised profits. But this came at a terrible cost, pun intended, because it means that newspaper journalistic ambitions were subjected to the interests of advertisers. So if you're someone who thinks too many journalists have been bought out by corporations, you might want to consider the idea that this has been going on a lot longer than you initially thought. Ask anyone who works in journalism, and they'll tell you how editors set aside space for advertisements before the news stories are fit to print. Sometimes a journalist will be asked to trim an article to make more space for promotions. It's no surprise that after La Presse changed its business model to advertising, ad agencies started to emerge. Let's pause here. Technically, the first ad agency was when William Taylor opened office in 1786 London, so he was very much the start of the European industry. But it was Volney B. Palmer who brought the idea to American soil around 1840. This difference in time by almost 60 years would suggest that the advertising industry got off to a slow start. No doubt merchants and business owners were content with doing things how they'd always been done, which was to keep everything in-house. There clearly wasn't enough reason to hire an outsider. Yet, by the time the competitors of La Presse caught wind of their successful business model, it upturned the world of journalism and print media forever. So maybe it was American grit. Or maybe it's perfect timing that suddenly saw ad agencies become viable. But either way, when Palmer brought marketing companies to the US, nothing would be the same especially because of a little thing called mass media. Chapter 4. Attack of the Brands The bridge between the 18th and 20th century saw the advent of technology that our ancestors could only dream of. Music recordings, cinema, television, radio, and more. The rate at which advertisements were made, bought, and distributed went into overdrive. Who needs oral tradition and Chinese flute players when we have the telephone? 
Love it or loathe it, the Industrial Revolution firmly integrated capitalism as one of the prevailing economic and philosophical structures for societies across the modern world, give or take a few communist experiments. That's why marketing is now a firm fixture of any business plan. Want to sell your record? You need a commercial on radio. Want to run a radio station? You need advertisers to fund it. Want to attract advertisers to your radio station? Pitch to record companies to buy advertising time slots. Round and round it goes, one hand cleaning the other. Content informs advertising and advertising informs content. Take soap operas. What started as radio dramas for 1920s housewives to listen to while they did chores resulted in demographic marketing. Radio broadcasters reached out to soap manufacturers to sponsor these time slots as their target market were the ones listening in. This was a huge shift. Okay, smile and say cheeseburger. Before, advertising was about getting anyone to like your product. Now, the power was in specificity. Since then, soap operas have morphed into their own full-fledged genre, and some no longer have the product tie-ins they once did. Yet television channels will always have a spot for them, so long as there's some commercial viability. So, if you've ever wondered why there's so much crap on TV, it's because some shows were a mutant consequence of advertising entering the industry. Imagine if the software available on your computer, like word processing and spreadsheet formatting, wasn't designed by computer engineers, but by advertisers. Like the proverbial frog in heated water, we can fool ourselves into thinking that the standards of entertainment and technology are just how things are. We forget what quality we're missing out on because advertisers had a say in the creative process. Look at brands. The transition from store name to brand is one of the biggest psychological manipulations advertisers have pulled, and it started back in 1891 when Kodak wanted to find a way to stand out from other camera manufacturers. Then, in 1908, Ford created sponsored publicity events to appear flashy, which gave advertising the idea that being cool was something that could be sold. For almost all of human existence, advertising was about clearly communicating the ins and outs of a product, but it was only at the start of the last century that we arrived at where we are now, selling ideas. A brand is nothing more than an in-group, the sense of belonging that can only exist in a consumerist society. Was the first iPod a success because people were eager to spend a couple hundred dollars on an MP3 player at the time where most people didn't want or need an MP3 player? Or was it their colorful TV spots that convinced us having this little white box put us at the top of the social hierarchy? We all have brands we're loyal to, but why? You might say because their products or services have a history of high quality. Chances are though, there's something about this company that is a part of your identity. Everyone has a preference between Apple computers and a Windows operating system, but unless you're an actual techie, you more than likely would do the same thing on either computer. So why not switch? Because figuring out that you need to press Command and C to copy instead of Control and C is too much? You know the answer. You like the image. You like how it makes you look. You like how it's a part of you. This all happened because of the 1960s. This was the decade of radical ideas, change, and movement. It was also after World War II when the economy was on the up. During this time, focus groups in psychology research were used by ad agencies to help them beat out their own competitors. The scientists and psychologists transformed advertising into a calculated science. John B. Watson's Little Albert experiment had a scary, loud noise play every time a child played with a rat. The result was the young boy developed a fear of rodents because the sound itself had been scary. That's why you cry at those soppy Christmas commercials with cute orphan puppies and whatnot. You are being programmed to associate feelings and those thoughts with products regardless of whether or not you genuinely have those feelings or thoughts towards the product. But that's nothing compared to advertisers' next bold move. Chapter 5. Selling Yourself Short For so long, agencies could only target those who had money. Fathers and mothers, husbands and wives. But by focusing on kids and persuading them to nag their parents for the latest gadget, it gave advertisers the ability to redirect spending power. This boomed in the 80s and 90s as the economy got stronger, technology got more powerful, and advertisers got richer. But to keep fresh, they had to change things up. Advertising got weird. Take the memorable bullfrog advert for Budweiser, or the expressive surfing commercial for Guinness. What is it with beer makers and strange TV spots? Well, car manufacturers are no different, or perfume sellers. Heck, even Apple hired Ridley Scott to direct the 1984-inspired commercial. And as advertising got bigger, so did the budgets and the love for them. If someone ever says that movie trailers are the best part of cinema experience, then they are, in effect, admitting that watching the advertisements are a meaningful part of their entertainment. Look, I'm not saying film trailers can't be fun, so let's try another example. Super Bowl adverts. 
This coveted time slot gets so much attention that the unveiling of advertisers gets the same cultural significance as a fashion show or award ceremony or royal wedding. And this was before the internet and smartphones. It used to be said that someone in the 21st century would see more advertisements in a day than a Victorian saw in their whole life. But with the advent of TikTok, Google Ads, and even YouTube, it's likely your morning commute exposes you to more commercial manipulation than most people throughout most of history. But hands down, the most toxic part of advertising infection is on reality itself. The clothing brand Supreme shows how you can create enough buzz to sell your merchandise before you even have merchandise. Images of people lining up around the block to buy simple t-shirts with a logo printed on it or a clay brick did wonders for the company as it jump-started word of mouth. Music producers used to manufacture rivalries between signed artists to get more coverage in gossip papers. And hiring content creators to promote products is almost the same price as advertisers creating commercials to look like real content creators. No doubt you've watched a piece of short-form content which you mistook as a genuine person at first. But it doesn't stop there. Brands hire PR teams to make their Twitter feeds, sorry, X feeds, feel personal and funny. Elon Musk even gives them a guide. Real life installations and pop up flash mobs utilize the FOMO effect of passersby so that you become the one promoting their product to your friends without even realizing it. And what is Instagram other than a way for people to advertise their own life, which is to say, advertising what their life could be? It's true what they say if a product is free, then you are the product. We went from shop signs letting people know you cut meat to falsifying your life to sell it to other people. And for what? Most of us aren't doing this because there's a paid promotion. Most of us are advertising ourselves for the sake of advertising. We're past the point where advertising informs the content. Now advertising is the content. And that's how advertising infected everything. So let us know which things you were duped into buying just because of the commercial. And if you want to see when advertising reached its lowest point in American history, then watch our video on the history of Amway. Be sure to like and subscribe to keep on learning how history works.